was a joke. Hi, my name is Stefano Carpani. I'm a psychoanalyst and a sociologist. And uh, today I would like to ask a question. How are women today? I'm a man, so I'm not entitled to answer this question. But a month ago, actually, almost two years ago, I asked this question to Susie Orbach. And I asked this in the context of my book, Breakfast at Kuznach, where I interviewed um, world-famous or world-renowned psychoanalysts and asked them questions about us, about the world, about the soul. And with Susie, who is one of the most important Freudian psychoanalysts, or post-Freudian psychoanalysts, not a Jungian one, I asked many questions about um, gender, relationship, love, revolution. I asked her, how are women today? Because sociology has wrote a lot about gender, and even psychology. But I wanted to have her point of view, hearing the point of view of someone that worked in the past 40 years with many, many individual men, women, and who was able to transform those individuals from maybe sad, depressed, anxious people into something else, maybe into themselves. I asked her, how are women today? Today, in the 21st century, she said, exactly the same. I think the whole issue of dependency and attachment and autonomy and work is still very much on the agenda. And then she added, I came across young women who feel it's very bad to have any dependency needs. It's very bad to have any dependency needs means that they feel they are independent. Maybe they are independent financially, but I would say not emotionally. They have to show they are independent. They feel very ashamed of them, of dependency needs. They don't know whether their work should occupy a huge amount of their life or where it should sit. That's particularly women in their 20s and 30s. They have a judgment that what feminism means or what the doors that we open mean is that they should be okay, whereas the word isn't okay. They needed to have been brought up to know that the world is full of struggle, indeed. And there are psychological struggles as well. To manifest themselves, to dare to express their longings, to dare to connect with others in a way that is both separate and connected. Separated attachment is key. Because that's really what the struggle is. And then she had both within feminism and within psychoanalysis. How do you do a separate attachment so you are not cut off, but you are not merged? Susie asked. And in that case, she talks about a book she wrote, The Impossibility of Sex, and talk about two patients. They brought a third party in. So there was a lesbian couple or a couple of female and female, and they brought a third party in, another woman. They brought a third party into it in order to deal with the problem of not knowing how to take up their own space. And then I asked her, or I said, these two patients of yours who came to you for couple therapy brought a third party. And I'm very interested in this issue, especially when I work in my practice as a practitioner here in Berlin, because it is interesting to work with, and especially women that really duel between their work and they love it, perhaps their family, partners, their kids and not being overwhelmed by all these. When women, following Giddens, are self-reflexive, and in this constant context of freedom, freedom beyond, beyond class, institution, society, freedom to be able to really live a life, but not then have to tick all the marks. And I said to Susie, I have a patient who says, I take the Excel chart. This is very interesting. As if women, but also men, leave to take the Excel chart. I did this 
seen that, done that. She answered, I've had experience with some young woman that they have ticked all the boxes, but they don't exist. I've got the boyfriend, tick the boxes. I've got the body, tick the boxes. I've got the job, but I don't. It's not even that I'm not happy. It is I've achieved, but those things are not integrated. They are not part of me. They are just satellites. And she added, I think that is partly because of feminism or their mothers. It's not to blame their mothers. It's not to blame feminism. But it was the historical moment in which they were raised, which tended to project onto those girls and foster ambition without actually underpinning it with Actually, it's very hard to do all these things. It's very hard to do all the things and connect them. So, they feel a bit empty, Susie Orbach underlines. And then she says, this is my experience. There is an example in her most recent book, she says, in therapy, in which the character Helen is in that situation. She is a lawyer. She's got everything going for her but she doesn't exist in an alive way for herself. To this, I would say that they miss substance, they miss purpose, but this is not a matter just for women. In my um, paper titled The Consequence of Freedom, I try to look this question, not the how are women today, but the substance question, with Gigerich. So to further investigate the, the concept of inner talk as I did last week and of purpose of substance um, and the need people have in Western society to find a momentary calmness before returning, recharged to the jungle of the affluent society. We talked about yoga and meditation last week. I want to look at Wolfgang Gigerich, realism. The German psychoanalyst, Jungian psychoanalyst, in his book The End of Meaning and the Birth of Man, which links to ego, suggests making a person fully aware through confrontation with her is unconscious ideas. So following Gigerich, working with these women that are not integrated, is to make to confront them with this idea. However, Gigerich queries whether lack of meaning is sufficient cause to make one neurotic, or whether the quest for meaning is merely the expression of neurotic pretentiousness, a claim to metaphysical grandiosity. It is the delusion that life is only life if there is, like in a dog race, the never to be rich one thing, the sausage, to race after. End of quote. Link again to the emptiness. Gigerich claims that Jung refused to see this, despite being aware of the danger of pointless seeking, which I compared to Samuel's Beckett waiting for Godot. Both actions are a sign of légeresse, of superficiality, indicating an impossible depth, impossible substance or purpose in life. As feminist writer, author, Simone de Beauvoir noted, Un femme libre est exactement le contraire d'une femme légère. A free woman is exactly the opposite, the contrary, of a superficial woman. Going beyond sex and gender, because it's important to go beyond sex and gender, depth and substance may be the antidote to légeresse, to superficiality, and a free individual is the opposite to a légère, superficial one. Therefore, the concept of em emptiness meaning, searching and waiting, are interwoven. All show a trait of ambivalence, I claim, wanting and rejecting, and meaninglessness is linked to a never-ending searching and waiting, until something, perhaps the numinous, happens to the individual or a symbol appears. But what if the numinous event, this symbol, never arises? 
or we are so distracted by the daily noise of the affluent lives that we fail to recognize it when it does come? This is what I call broken individualization and broken liquidity. In this regard, Gigerich recalls Jung's example of a woman who does not live the life that makes sense, because she's nothing. But if she could say, I'm the daughter of the moon, every night I must help the moon, my mother over the horizon. Ha, that is something else. Then she lives. Then her life makes sense. Looking for the moon. Gigerich claimed that this is in fact not a cure, as Jung claimed, and that the Pueblo Indian model cannot be applied to the modern woman because it would involve an endless futile search. Thus, Jung's suggestion, Gigerich underlines, feeds her neurotic craving, her addiction, her wanting to be the daughter of the moon. Instead, Gigerich proposed as a real cure that she goes, I believe, towards what Thomas Bernard called the opposite direction. That is, that she be made fully aware that her unconscious idea is that she ought to be the daughter of the moon is why she's desperately traveling. Thus, she's confronted with the exaltedness, inflatedness of the unconscious demands and expectations. This is the very opposite attitude to that described by Bauman and Italo Calvino. Therefore, Gigerich claims, why should she not be able, like everybody else, to find satisfaction, contentedness in ordinary life? In this way, Gigerich realism helps to understand the limitation of contemporary mainstream sociology, which does not examine unconscious motives. By realizing that she's not a queen in search for the recognition due but denied to her, it could permit her to accept following Orbach, her ordinary unhappiness is in contrast to the hystericidal narcissistic desire for accomplishment. Her ordinary unhappiness is in contrast to the hystericidal narcissistic desire for accomplishment and even allow new developments to arise. Thank you. I wish you a nice week.